If you recognise this Issue 2 ZX Spectrum, that's because it was in the very recent video in which we talked in detail about Composite Video and S-Video. You may recall that this board was able to produce a decent grayscale image but had the classic Issue 2 issue of having a yellow tinted screen despite our efforts to tune it. We went to great lengths to try and figure out how composite video works, how S-Video works, and we came to the conclusion that in order to get a good picture out of this we would have to change the ULA. That was until we decided to go ahead and replace the S-Video board with a component video board. We have used one of these boards previously on the channel, here are some clips from that video, and oh, if you think I sound depressed now, wait till you try watching some of the older videos on the channel when I hadn't really learned to project. So the first job we're faced with is removing the old modulator case. This is a pretty beefy, tricky task, and the first part for me is just to get everything nice and hot and flowy. So I'm going to heat these joints, I might even get the hot air gun out, and just get everything nice and compliant. This isn't something I do every day, so I'm kind of making it up as I go along. Basically the idea is to get these joints nice and hot, it's a big ground plane with a case attached to it so we need lots of heat, and then I can push down on the leg, push it through the joint, and remove one side at a time. The legs are bent over, so it's kind of grabbing onto the board as well, which makes things even more difficult, and they're quite beefy and hard to bend. I did in the end get the right hand leg out, which made the left hand leg come out much easier. I find these jobs quite tricky because you have to put so much heat into the, into the board whilst trying to remove a big component, and you really don't want to damage the board in the process. With the modulator removed, I could clear these joints, and you can see just how much metal, how much solder is around these joints. It reminds me of Terminator 2. So, enter the component video board, and look at the size of that FPGA chip. FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array, and it is one of a few kinds of PLD, or Programmable Logic Devices. So, it's a logic device, you can design the logic you want and program it into there. It's got so many logic elements inside that you can configure to do whatever you want and interact with each other in a certain way. It's got onboard memory, I.O., things like that. I'm going to stop going on about them because I'm so new to it, I'm going to say something incorrect. But basically, it's a bit like a ULA in that it contains logic elements that you can uh, program to do what you want. This particular chip, an Altera Max 10, has Intel all over the datasheet, but I've just learned that Intel has sold off Altera and now it is a separate entity. Interesting. Anyway, it has 144 pins, and this particular application only requires 10 pins, so um, lots of lots of I.O. pins not being used. However, it must be a fairly intensive job to sniff the data bus and produce the necessary outputs to feed the chip, which is also on this board, that produces the analog video signals. Here's a close-up of this awesome chip. That bit on the left is just fluff, it's not a short, so don't panic. On the other side of the board we have these two chips. These are level shifting transceivers because the board is running on 3.3 volts logic levels and the ZX Spectrum is working on 5 volts so we need to shift the logic levels. This chip is producing our video signals that go off to the monitor. The only other I see on here is this which is a voltage regulator. That's because the FPGA runs off 3.3 volts whereas the Spectrum is running off 5 volts. Anyway, we're not here to reverse engineer this, there is a comprehensive GitHub anyway. If you do want to have a go at making this yourself, head over to the GitHub, link in the description, and you can get all the files for the KiCad project. This will enable you to see exactly how it's put together, have a look at the schematic, generate Gerbers, and have them manufactured. Here it is looking neat in 3D. Now building this yourself is going to be a bit of a task, because Look at all these little SMD devices. It would be a good, um, a good, a good project to practice your SMD soldering. Let's put it that way. Especially this S uh, FPGA chip with its 144 pins. Getting your PCB manufactured is extremely easy. If you head over to PCBWay, who are sponsoring the video today, once you have your Google files generated using, in this case, KiCad, you just upload them, and it will detect the contents for you. You just tell it how many you want decide on some details about the board, although the default values are normally okay, 
pick some funky colors if that's what you want. You can go over and pick your shipping method. Some of it can be very cheap, and some of it can be more expensive depending how urgently you want it. Let's go with the cheaper option here, apply, and we can simply save it to the cart. Once the order has processed and it's passed a review, you can view it here in a preview to make sure you're happy with your choices. Well, I quite like those colors actually. And then proceed to check out and you're away. Once you've ordered your board, you can see all of the manufacturing steps with explanation videos in real time until the board is on its way to you. Thanks again to PCBWay for sponsoring the video. This is nice, when you remove the modulator case, you get to see the secret uh, message under here which just says Sinclair ZX Spectrum issue 2. You don't often get to see that. Anyway, our component video board sits in here, right where the RF modulator case was, using the same two legs to support it and for ground. I'm just going to tack them in with a little bit of solder so I can get the thing straight. And after a lot of messing around, I managed to get it sitting pretty much where I wanted it. So the next job is to hook up the inputs, and these are the inputs we need. It's the entire data bus, D0 to D7 and three extra signals which are CAS, the column address strobe, the IO rack signal and the write signal. Now this is really clever actually to be able to decide if the data byte you're seeing on a data bus is made up of video memory based only on the data bus CAS, IO and WR. There's no address signals being fed in here. So how does that work? Well the CAS signal is from the ULA to the lower memory so we know that when that is doing stuff the ULA is trying to either read from or write to lower memory. By monitoring the write signal we know if it's a write operation or a read operation and we're interested in read operations. This combined with the REO rec signal tells us that there's a read going on from the lower memory. However, not all lower memory is video data. So how do you know that it's video data that you're seeing? Well, when the ULA reads from lower memory and it's doing it to get video data, there's quite a distinctive pattern in these control signals which distinguishes it from a normal CPU read of the low memory which the ULA does on the Z80's behalf. Shall we put a logic analyzer on it? Yeah, go on then. I've got the ZX Spectrum logic analyzer here. By the way, if anyone wants one of these, I have a couple of spare kits, so get in touch, I can sort you out with one. Now, because the CAS signal isn't on the edge connector, I've had to use a probe hook, boo, but it's gonna show us what we want to see. So let's have a look in the software and see what our trace looks like. I've got a trace here showing the CAS timing during video reads, so during ULA reads of the video memory. And this is gonna show us how the FPGA chip is recognizing that video memory is being read from RAM and so it can snipe the data off the data bus and process it. So I've put the signal here Y, which is our luminance data, into the logic analyzer. That's pretty unconventional because this is an analog signal, so this is kind of a bad thing to do. However, we can roughly see when it's low, that's corresponding to the horizontal blanking signal. So everything that's happening between these low periods on the Y signal must be one scan line's worth of activity. So one row of pixels in our pixel display and the border display. Now let's zoom in a little bit and zoom in across over here. I'll talk you through the signals. Uh, we're not interested in M1. WR, that's right. That's our right signal when it's low something is writing to memory and we're not interested in those bits, we're just looking for the memory reads as far as I'm aware. IORQ being high means that all of these requests aren't IO requests so we can assume that they're memory requests, memory reads or writes. So that stays high, we can remove that. We also have the CAS signal which is one of the signals which is plumbed in to our uh, FPGA chip and I've done some other videos explaining in great detail what RAS and CAS do, so we don't need to go into that now, you can go and check those videos out. Down here we have the RAS signal, whoops, sorry. This isn't plumbed in to our FPGA chip, we don't need it, but we can just use it to demonstrate what's going on here. So between these two low pulses on Y, we have one row of pixels worth of information. And zooming in a little bit, and moving over to the right, what you'll see is, while the row address strobe, I need to zoom in a lot more, hang on. Okay, so while the RAS signal is low, the CAS signal goes twice. 
And what's happening here is for each row of pixels, now divide it into bytes, so eight pixels at a time. The ULA first reads a byte of uh, video data, so that would be uh, a one means the pixel is on and a zero means the pixel is off if you like, it's a way to think about it. Then it has to read the associated attribute data. Attribute data applies to the whole cell that the pixel finds itself in and it tells the uh, ULA what colour it is, if it should be flashing, things like that. So we take 8 pixels worth, 1 byte of information and that corresponds to 8 pixels in a row on the scan line we're looking at. Then we take the attribute data of it and we get um, a little pulse on RAS and then it happens again, we get two more. And this is due to how the ULA is designed. It loads in two bytes at a time, queues one up behind the other. And it happens again exactly the same. So we get the next eight pixels and their attribute data. And this pattern of four low pulses on CES happens all the way along our scan line. You can see it, it's easy to recognize. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, and so on. Cool, okay. Good so far. Our FPGA chip is obviously programmed to recognize that and based on that it has confidence that the data byte that goes onto the data bus at that time must be video data. <laughs> okay, good. Now, um, moving back over here. Let's count them out of interest. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So we've got 16 of them and um, and each one of them is bringing in 16 bits or so 2 bytes worth of data and we get 256 pixels. That is the horizontal resolution of the ZX Spectrum pixel display. So that's cool, that also makes sense. And what, what this FPGA chip must also be doing is synchronizing itself with the um, each scan line so it knows which scan line, which row of pixels is being read out at a time. So that's also something that's very clever and I haven't figured out how it's doing that yet. Anyway, we've got a job to do, so let's start hooking this thing up. I'm using a slightly thicker wire for the power and I found a nice neat way to run it uh, up and under the board around the side, which is kind of nice. And I'm using this thinner patch wire to patch up all of the various inputs. Of course, it's up to you how thick or thin you go with the wire. Thicker is a bit more unsightly, thinner is a bit neater but a bit more delicate and you just need to find a sweet spot. After finding all the wires that I could leach these signals off, it was all put together. I'll either tape these wires down to neaten them and try and prevent them from snagging or at least kind of bundle them all together. So let's plug it in. I know the colours don't match but I picked up this cable from a car boot sale in Rill after doing an all nighter in Wales. Don't ask, that was a bit of a strange morning but it works a treat and not bad for 20p. So let's see if the board is working. Spoiler, it didn't work. And here's why. What was a little bit of an inconvenience was the board arrived with an unflashed FPGA chip on there and it's fairly simple to flash one if you know how, but I had to order a programmer. I just got a cheap clone one from Amazon and then learn how to install the drivers, which software to use, install the software and how to use the software to flash the um, program. But we got there in the end and it was finally up and running. I can put component video directly into this monitor I'm using and the results were pretty fantastic to be honest. Here is the result. This is a macro lens pointed at my monitor and I'm just letting the Jet Set Willy pause screen run because it cycles through a whole number of different combinations of colours and I think it's a kind of nice real example which tests the video output in a lot of different ways. Let's put a composite video signal above it and compare. Now this might not be the most fair test, this is just the nearest spectrum I could grab that has composite video, I've plugged it in, haven't gone to town making sure that this is the best possible picture that this board can produce, but you, you get the idea. Now obviously it's a matter of personal opinion, if you want your picture to be all crispy HD like the one on the bottom or if you want it to be a bit more authentic and old school and fuzzy like the one on the top. My personal preference would be to go for the cleaner picture of the component video mod. The obvious downside of this is the effort required to implement it and the cost of it. 
So that's about it, that's all I've got to say on the component video mod. Congratulations Copper Dragon for the awesome design, I'm really impressed with this and it's so neat how it fits within the case. I might get one for myself. For now I'm going to get this board put back together, a bit of tape over all those patch wires, test it out and get it back to the owner. Thanks everyone for watching and I'll see you in the next one.